Hello everybody. Today I'm going to talk about complexity. You can't really avoid it, especially not in a game dev environment, but complexity can easily get away from you. Uh, complexity isn't really length, it's more how hard it is to hold in your head. And oftentimes if you've been making a game or a prototype and then one day you've just felt really bogged down by it, like suddenly it's this big wet heavy blanket, that's often because it's become too complex for you to hold in your head. And uh, that is something you need to avoid. Whether you realize that you've made it too complex or not, generally speaking, you want to avoid any kind of complexity. Uh, you want to offload all of that complexity as much as possible. And how do you do that? Well, I already said you can't really not be complex. But you have some choices as to how you face that complexity. It really depends on the tool. Unity is is best at this scene view editing this part here this is what unity is really good at so if you were going to try and offload complexity in unity offloading it to the part of unity that works the best is probably a pretty good idea so what I've done is I've created the, this medieval building construction kit or I've started to create it and I have offloaded a lot of the complexity to right here in the game world now, if you're building a level with this, you don't have to go down into the prefabs and be like, oh, uh, uh, what, what, drag and drop, drag and drop, which, which, which of these do I want? Uh, you don't have to do that because it's all built right in. And it layers. It, it's recursive. So this was an easy thing to build, and it means that if I am developing levels, I'll have a relatively easy time trying to set up unique houses. And all of this is still fully compatible with the default Unity controls. So I've just duplicated it, and it kept all of the selections I've made, and now it is an exact duplicate of that other wall I created. And I can move it into position like this, or using the V snapping, and uh, it just works great. And of course, if I need to edit it, I just click. Super easy. And that is the power of this approach. When you're building a house, you don't have to worry about it, um, you know, not making sense or having to, to change prefabs later or switch out all of the hundreds of thousands of meshes that you may have in your house and then rebake it all. Oh, what a pain in the ass. But at the same time, you still have the flexibility of being able to do things that normally you wouldn't be able to do in a total prefab solution. Yep, now the door is on this side. So how did I do this? Well, the big idea here is to offload all of the complexity into this game environment where the level editor will be able to actually make all of these changes. But before I could do that, I had to put some of the complexity over here in the inspector, which is kind of a second best place for it. It's better than code. If you put it in code, the code is off in a corner somewhere. You're going to forget about it. You're going to get bogged down by special cases. It's much better to use either the inspector view or the scene view, depending on what you need. These are both very good tools for managing complexity. And uh, that's what I had to do first. I first had to create the tool that lets you do this. And how is that tool? What is it tool? How does it work? Well, it's called the Mesh Option Script. It's very basic. And the idea here is that I just put all of the various options here in this list. And these are all prefabs. And then when I click on this, it just switches which of the prefabs are currently selected. And it deletes out the prefab if none is needed. And it, you know, it doesn't make a mess. Uh, and then later on I can bake all of these into a single mesh if I'd like. I don't have to leave them each individual. So let's take a look at how this works. The first thing we need to understand is that there are two different kinds of Unity objects in play here. Two different kinds of scene view objects. Both of these are really annoying to learn how to use and the help, you know, the tutorials on how to use them are terrible. So I'm hoping that this will give you a little bit of a leg up. Once you know how to use them, it's pretty easy to look up any given function and know what it means. But until you learn how to use them, it's totally opaque and it's a real nightmare. 
So first let's talk about these yellow balls I've put in. You can make them look like whatever you want, but yellow balls are super easy. So these are called gizmos. And a gizmo is something that can be clicked on. So these are empty, uh, these are empty objects. There's nothing there, and I'm sure you know how difficult it is to click on an empty object. So the reason that those yellow balls exist is because otherwise uh, I would not be able to click on those empty objects. So that's the, the whole reason for the yellow ball is so that I can click on an empty object. With that said, let's go take a look at how we did that. This is a pretty simple script, very short, less than one page. And basically, it has a couple of functions. The size is how large the yellow ball is. Uh, the options is a list of options. The current option is whatever the current option is, with negative one being null. And then, of course, we have the current instance, which we can delete when we change options and put a new instance in. So the two tricky pieces here are onDraw Gizmos and onDraw Gizmos Selected. OnDraw Gizmos always runs, and OnDraw Gizmos Selected only runs when it or its parent is selected. So these are very basic. I just draw a sphere of a color. So I define the gizmos color, and then I draw a sphere around the object's center. Super basic, right? Well, that's all you have to do in order to be able to click on it, because a gizmo can be clicked on. That's, that's it. This wire sphere is just to show you uh, how many things are going to be affected if you delete or whatever. So if I were to select this here, you can see how now there are a little bit of a yellow wire, or a white wire sphere around these, just to tell you that all of those are in fact going to be deleted if you hit delete. Well, they're gone! So that was pretty basic, right? That's all I needed to do to be able to select it. And down here, this is just the function for deleting the current instance if there is one. You have to use destroy immediate because you're in edit mode and not in gameplay mode. And then you also have to uh, increase the number, increase the option. And if you have gone past the end of the list, you go back to the beginning. And uh, then you instantiate a new object, you put it in the right spot. And then this line here moves it again. So theoretically, this line should be all you need in order to move it into the right spot. But it turns out that in edit mode, it doesn't work right. <laughs> so you then have to set it again which is obnoxious, but that's okay, it's not too bad. Um, so this is the script. Wah, not very complex, and I'm sure that you can read it. Uh, this, is, this is super basic stuff. Um, I can share it if necessary, but it's so basic that you could type it in in less time than it would take to download it. And it might be a good thing to do if you wanted to. You can pause it and type it in because this is a solidly done set of easy uh, it, it's a very easy way to do things, and it'll teach you a lot about how gizmos work and how instantiating and deinstantiating works in edit mode. So, that's a mesh option. But what about that that thing? This thing? What what about this? How does that work? Well, that is the other kind of scene view editing tool, and that's called a handle. Handles are a little bit more uh, complex. And uh, there are a lot of handles out there that you can go and download and stuff, but if you want to make a button handle like this, I'm going to teach you how right now. So you need to do it in an editor. Now, if you've never made an editor script, this is how it works. You create an editor in, in this directory. So there's a directory called capital E Editor. And if there isn't a directory called that, you can just make it. And then you create a script in there. And if the script, if the, if, if the script is in the editor directory, then it will try and run while you're editing. But that's not all. You have to do a lot of stuff inside the script. I'm just letting you know the very first step to creating a custom editor is putting it in the editor directory. Now there are a lot of tutorials on how to make custom editors, so if you wanted to learn more about that, or if you didn't get what I'm saying and you're confused, go and watch a de tutorial dedicated to that. But most of those tutorials are not going to teach you how to do handles. So I'm going to show you how to do handles now. Oh, what a long, long one line. <laughs> so, what I've done here is I've extended the class editor, which says that this is something that needs to run in edit mode, and it's in the editor directory, so it runs. And the way that this works is this editor will run whenever the selected object, whenever the object it covers, is selected. What object does it cover? Well, you define what it covers right here. Custom editor for the type of mesh option. So that means that whenever I select a mesh option object, this will run. Now normally what you'd do with an editor is you would put stuff over here. 
So if I selected this mesh object, this would be the part that the editor changes. But instead, we have used the on scene GUI. And this scene GUI is handles and gizmos. So first what you do is you take the target. Target is always a generic object. So you're going to have to cast it to whatever it actually is if you want to use it. Then what I do is I use the if handles button trick. This is a very straightforward trick. Handles.button returns a Boolean value if it's clicked. I mean, it always returns a Boolean value. It returns true if it's clicked. So this is a very easy way to put a button into the game world. You have to tell it where you want the game, where you want the button, but this is all like, you, you can fill it in, see? Where you want the button, which direction you want the button pointing, uh, what size you want the button, how large you want the button to actually catch when someone mouses over it and clicks on it, and the cap function. The cap function is what kind of visual you want. Uh, now it comes with a lot of cap functions. Anything that stops with cap, so all of these cap functions are perfectly viable. I used the cylinder cap just because I thought it looked nice. Uh, unfortunately, there is no you know button cap, and you can't really control how large the cylinder is and how tall it is. So I can't flatten it into a proper button. But you can also override that. If you're filling your oats, you can specify any function you want, uh, including one that you make up yourself and just draw whatever the heck you want. So that's just this is just the easy way to do it. You can make it a lot more complex. And then, you know, if I find out that someone clicked the button, I say mo.next option, which was this. So this is a very very short short set of of classes. We've got the main class here, which is basically just a data class with a little bit of instantiation code. And then we've got the editor class, and the only role of the editor class is to show a button and then when I click on it, call the mesh options only function. So this is a very, very straightforward and easy set of classes. And I really encourage you to type this up on your own or ask me questions about it if you don't understand what I did because this is as easy as it gets. This is a really nice set of tools uh, for allowing you to create variants by clicking. This isn't the only way to reduce complexity, but it is a super easy way and it means that you can get away with a lot. Um, I can build an arbitrarily huge house in just a couple of minutes using this. And this is something I can extend. So for example, I can easily put a new class over here, which has like an arrow, because arrow is one of the gimbals we can draw, and one, um, one of the handles we can draw. And if you click on the arrow, it can just want another wall segment. Or maybe I'll have an arrow pointed this way, this way, and this way. You click want segment going that direction. This is super easy to extend. The basic idea is very sound and very extensible. So I encourage you, if you have a lot of variations, this is not a bad way to do it. So if you've got like 100 different weapons that, you're, that your characters can use and you're still dragging them from down here into the weapons uh, into each character, you might think about switching it up so that you can design your characters here in scene view. You put down an enemy and then you click on his hand and you get a little yellow ball that lets you change what weapon he's got equipped. Obviously, Inspector View is still better for things like stats, but, you know. Just to be clear, this is not something which exists in, in Game View. So, as you can see, there we go, there are no glowing yellow balls in Game View. It's just the pure results in Game View. And we can also bake it. We can bake it down into one mesh. We don't have to leave it as 800 different meshes. So, it's really a powerful tool. Uh, an easy way to make this sort of complexity work. Let me know if you have any questions, and um, yeah. I'm just going to reopen that mesh editor so that you can see it. That's it. Have a good one.